this is an annual highlight for us here because it's uh, the time of year when we get to uh, welcome and spend time with the Stuber family. And uh, we're delighted for them. Their generosity, their leadership uh, has allowed us uh, to offer this for now the 33rd year of the Stuber Lectures. And um, absolutely. I was, I was just having a conversation with Ross Stuber uh, about um, the multi-generational uh, giving of families to Colgate Rochester Crozier in all the, the ways that um, we receive giving. And Ross and I were talking about how very often as families age, you're still referring to the kids as the kids. Yeah. And um, we have two of the kids here, uh, and uh, we also have a, a grandkid. And, uh, but we are delighted they make such a special effort uh, every year to come. Uh, and over the past several years, we've had uh, an even broader representation from the Stuber family. But we are always delighted and thank you so much for coming here today and for making this possible. We are so grateful. I'm going to begin by reading a little bit about uh, the Stuber lectures. And then I'll introduce uh, one of our students, Damond Wilson, who will introduce today's guest lecturer. The Stuber Lectureship was inaugurated in 1984 by the children of Dr. Stanley I. Stuber in honor of his 80th birthday. Dr. Stuber was an alumnus of Rochester Theological Seminary, class of 1928, who became a leading Baptist pastor, writer, and editor. He was a noted ecumenist, thus the lectures in his honor focus on ecumenical issues. Dr. Stuber died in 1987 and his wife, Helen, in 1994. Their surviving children and spouses continue to support the lectureships. Sylvia Stuber and Walter Heap, Roscoe and Barbara Stuber, Lois Stuber, Kenneth Spitzer. Additional funding was provided by the charitable gift annuity of Helen Stuber. So we are so grateful for the Stuber family for coming here today and for all that they represent and continue to support CRCDS. Thank you. I'd like now to introduce Damon Wilson, who will introduce today's speaker. Damon. Wow, it's, a, it's amazing to hear of a graduate graduating in 1928. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> yes, here I am looking to uh, attain my Master of Divinity in uh, 2019. It's, so it's, it's, a, it's definitely a, a ways off, I will tell you that. But I would say that with me introducing our speaker today, it's truly an honor and a pleasure. I made, my, I made a promise to not to be long-winded, so I'm going to uh, cut this down a little bit. I'll try to be a man of my word. Um, I must say in the Conversations that me and Dr. Hunt have had thus far have been both enlightening as well as encouraging. Uh, I think back and I remind, I'm reminded of my childhood to where those stories I used to hear my parents and my grandparents tell me. And I remember the places that where it used to take me, where my imagination would uh, go and, and explore. And to have and to know uh, uh, Dr. Hunt and him to be able to take me back to those places is a truly amazing feeling. I hope that he uh, has some stories prepared for us so you can know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, brief, uh, brief introduction of some of his accomplishments. He is the professor of preaching and practice ministry at New York Theological Seminary. He is a retired senior chaplain uh, of the New York uh, State uh, Department of Corrections and Community Services at Sing Sing. Uh, but also, he's also the 35-year uh, pastor at Bethel Missionary Baptist Church. And just to hear just some of his accomplishments and some of the accolades that he's uh, attained along the way is astounding. So without further ado, I would like to what bring up, I would like to say a friend, and also an uh, 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 able uh, educator, Dr. Edward Hunt. Uh, 
I'm Baptist, so I have to say church, say amen. Amen. <laughs> Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows my sorrow. Nobody trouble I seen glory hallelujah although you see me gone alone oh yeah Lord I got my troubles here say, why did you do that? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> In the classroom, when I do something and I'm waiting for a response, I usually do this. <laughs> the reason why I did that was because in the confines of the prison, nobody knows. First of all, let's make a clarification. People usually look at the prison system with a great deal of negativity. You need to change that attitude. And the reason why you need to change the attitude is because the prison didn't send them to prison. It's the judicial system. And the tremendous imbalance that seems to take place within the confines of the judicial system. And you say, well, what do you mean by that? What, what I mean by it is that you'll have two inmates arrested at the same time for the same crime. One is from suburbia and the other one is from the inner city. The one from the inner city is getting 12 and a half to 25 years, and the one from suburbia is getting three and a half to five. And so it's a matter of who put them there. And then you have to look at the geographics. Based upon the geographics that we are confronted with, you'll see the uh, the judicial system act in a different way. I'm going to tell you this story. A young man, 18 years old, just finishing work at his little job while he was going to school. And while he's walking down the street, getting ready to go home, back to the school, two police officers grab him. And they kept referring to him as Johnson. He was beaten and he was thrown in the bullpen. And he stayed there until in the morning when his boss came to retrieve him. His boss's name was Arnold Schwartz. And he fought with them to get the young man released. I was the young man. Mm -hmm. 
it's so easy where you can go to jail. Another war story. A graduate from Fordham University going out with two other friends, going to a club to have some fun. College grads. They were on the same street in Mount Vernon that they were doing a raid down the street. So the young men were arrested because they looked like they belonged over there. They found no drugs, no weapons, but it was election season in White Plains, Mount Vernon rather. And because it was election season and we had to show law and order, Everybody was arrested. It was my son. I went to the county jail and I said to the man, I says, question, were there any drugs? No. I said, were there any weapons? No. I said, okay. I said, what are we going to do? And so he said, this is going all the way. It's election season. You know how this goes. Well, you say, well, what does that mean? Well, I'm saying to all of you, $55,000 later, he was arrested, was let go rather. And $55,000 later, One of the other boys, mother and father didn't come out. And he spent two years in jail. Because the district attorney wanted to prove herself tough in White Plains and so therefore, it happened in Mount Vernon, but she had to get reelected. The problem is, if there is no voice, all too often, if there's no voice and no connection, it makes a big difference. What happens in the inner city versus what happens in suburbia is two different things. And that's the thing that we need to understand. And it's not a matter of anything else except people's perception of another person. I was in a town meeting in Fishkill, where I live at, and this one particular man was extremely nasty to me. And sometime during the meeting, he decided my first name started with N. And I told him, you do not have that right to speak to me that way. I said, if you want to curse me out and if you want to call me names, the first thing you're going to have to do is sit down and break bread with me. We went to the 84 diner. <laughs> And after we went to the 84 diner, I ordered coffee, he ordered coffee, and I said, one piece of cheesecake, and they said, should we split it? I said, no. <laughs> Bring two forks and put it on the table. And we sat there for an hour before he attempted to eat any of the cheesecake. Then he began to eat at one end and I was eating at the other end and finally we met in the middle. <laughs> and we're eating this cheesecake. And when we left, he had a different attitude. Somebody might want to say what happened to the relationship after that. I can't get rid of it. <laughs> I 
I get the phone call, Ed, you coming to the meeting? No, I don't want to be with any racist folk. <laughs> and so he said, well, if there's any there, I'll put them out. <laughs> but the thing is this, if you don't know people, then what happens is you have a perception of people. Look at the case of the airline. Well, I'm talking about the doctor. Not that doctor, the black doctor that was on the airline and someone fell out and she says, I'm an MD, can I help? And they pushed her out of the way and they let somebody who was nobody work on the person and then found out later that she was a medical doctor. Emergency room. And they didn't let her come in simply because of that. Caring is everybody's business. But what happens is we have this tendency of caring for our own, whoever our own are. Somebody say amen. amen. Let me explain this to you. The prison system. First, an individual is arrested. And usually when a man goes to prison, and I'll say men because I've worked with men in prison. When a man goes to prison, he spends a uh, He's been to court six to eight times. Six to eight times for problematic instances, and then finally he is arrested. In fact, when they get locked up, they usually have parties when they, you know, of when I'm back home. But then one time they go and they don't get released. And they go to prison. The first thing that happens to them is, uh, you know they're over at Rackers Island, down in the city, or they're at the county jail. The county jail, you can do 364 days in the county jail. Anything over a year, you must spend in the state prison. And the city jail just holds you, you know, sleep it off, if there is a city jail. But the state prison is, is any amount of time that a man can serve. And one man said he couldn't serve that much time. The judge told him to do as much as he could. Because that's the attitude. So what happens is, when a man goes into the confines of the prison, it takes him about three years to settle down. And the reason why, because it's a peculiar institution. I know that they say, you know, the book is slavery, the peculiar institution, but prisons are. Prisons are. And what happens is, prisons are part of the whole system of deconstructing society and reconstructing it to what you want it to be. I mean, you know, uh, Steve Bannon wasn't the first one about being a deconstructionist. It's been around. And you know Glass's book on, on uh, uh, regulating the poor. And what happens is the, the ghettos are contrived, carefully planned. And so therefore, people are isolated in certain geographics. When I was down in Yonkers living, and I was working for City Hall for a short period of time, I told the people, I said, Yonkers is messed up. And they said, what do you mean it's messed up? I said, it's all wrong. And so they said, what do you mean it's all wrong? I said, they got black folk living at the waterfront. <laughs> and then they got middle class white folk living in the middle of Yonkers. And so I said, y'all better wake up because they're going to switch it around. <laughs> you don't believe it? Look on the map. They've taken all of the houses away by uh, eminent domain. And they fixed them and uh, nobody in this room can afford to live at the waterfront. I mean, just a studio apartment would cost you a million and a half. You know, and, and, and it, that's real. And so what happens is we have 
a deconstruction of our society. And then we've got a new racism that exists. It goes for everybody in this room of any color. And the new racism in the room is economic segregation. If you haven't met it, uh, we sold our home on one side of town. It was, in fact, it was brought from underneath us. And when we bought the home, uh, went over to the other side of town to buy another home, they couldn't allow us to come in unless we had a 750 credit score. But what helped me was I had all the money from the other house and I just put it up and I said, well, will this help? <laughs> I said, I realize economic segregation but with $340,000 help. Oh, Dr. Hunt, you're just the type of people that we would love to have in this development. I said, I thought so. <laughs> so what happens is those who are not privileged find themselves in a position where they must try to survive. And how do I survive? If I get picked up for anything, I'm going to be subject. Down in our community, I usually wear a shirt and tie, have a jacket with me. And my son would say to me, Dad, why do you dress up every day? I said, it's my uniform. I said, what do you mean your uniform? I said, if they see a black man dressed up with a shirt and tie on, they'll be slow and they might think he is somebody or he knows somebody and they'll slow up on doing something to him. Yeah. So when they stop my car, they're always, I, I can't understand it. Every car I get is the car the police are looking for. <laughs> I said to the police officer one time, can you just tell me what you're not looking for so I'll buy that car? <laughs> so I put the windows down and I, I take my wallet out and I look up on the dashboard, put my hands up like this, right. and I sit there and I look straight ahead. Why are you nervous? You got your hand on the gun. And so therefore, what I have to go through a lot of folk in here don't have to go through it. So a man gets picked up, he goes to jail, and he finds himself in the belly of the beast. When he finds himself in the belly of the beast, what does he do? The first thing he does is he tries to survive. When we look at men in prison, the first thing we began to do during orientation is we tell them there's a couple of things that you need to take into consideration, son. What's that? Number one, I need you to eat. I need you to keep yourself physically strong because if you get sick, mama's not coming with chicken soup and orange juice. Then I need you to keep your mind active because we want you to do the time and the time not to do you. The next thing we want you to do is we want you to have a level of spirituality. I don't care what denomination, you better have you some God on your side. And so they said, why? I said, because in the Jewish tradition, it's body, mind, and spirit. And if you are out of sync, then you're out of balance. And the man has to have the balance in order to survive the contriveness of the prison system. Because there is two governance that take place within the con three, that take place in the, con in the confines of the prison. And anyone here that has worked in the prison, you can say amen when I finish with the three. First, it's what the superintendent says and the administration. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Okay, that those that have worked in prison. Okay, the second one is what the police officers say. That's number two. Okay, and then the third one is what the inmates say. 
Amen? Amen. <laughs> and so what happens is you've got to try to find the balance within the confines of the institution and understand that there is a hierarchy in the prison system. And the hierarchy is based upon uh, usually how long a man's been down. Okay? And he's doing a bit. Now, we heard a number, young lady, she read, uh, the Reverend read at the chapel service, she read the, uh, the letter from the inmate or the present consumer of correctional services. Be a little bit more dignified in this crowd. And, and so what happens is he has an 11 number. That means 2011. The A is the geographical location of where he came from. And then the last four numbers is the number of his incarceration. That he is the 1,189th inmate of the year. That's how it works. The one that really will freak you out is to look at the first inmate to come in on a particular year with the 0001. Okay, and so when he's in the jail, the first thing that happens to him is he is emotionally raped. Not physically raped, but emotionally raped. Your name is no longer, your name, sir. What is your name? Ken. Ken? Ken. Ken what? Dodson. Okay, you're no longer Ken Dodson. You are now uh, 17B. One, three, five, seven, and don't you forget it. I don't want to hear your name. Your name doesn't mean a hill of beans to me. I want to know your number. You understand that? Huh? I've already forgotten it. Oh, no, you won't. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is this. I hear you, but in the confines of the prison, you will not forget it. You will not forget it, and you will understand. They'll give you a little book. It's about this big, about that big, and about that wide, and it's called the Inmate Rule Book. And that means direct order. And I'll say, I want that picture moved. That's, and you say, so-and-so is working over there. I just gave you a direct order. You want to get a key block 10 days? You know, uh, look at an officer the wrong way. Young lady just walked by and you turned around. Oh, look like you need some rest. You miss sick call and now you're sick? Oh, so you're sick now. Sick call went out 20 minutes ago. You're sick now? Let's get you well. So 10 days keep lock should make you feel better. That means you can't come out of your cell. And when they do a keep lock, what they do is they take a padlock and put it on the bar and then close it. And as long as that padlock is on the bar, the bar is here, the padlock is here, and it's outside, that means that gate does not open. You stay in. You did one hour wreck in the short yard. And so what happens is the whole system is really geared towards breaking the man down. Because if you take an elephant and you chain his front legs and stand him there, and that elephant begins to understand that he cannot move any further than this. Take the chain off and the elephant won't move. Take him back to the same spot and he won't move. And the reason he won't move is because he's been conditioned. You become conditioned and you have to receive this conditioning factor so that you can therefore adjust in the prison, understanding what you can say, what you can do, how you can do it, and what you can't do. The only place of solace for you is to connect yourself with the chaplain, go to the library, law library and to look at your case 
Uh, the education department, if you don't have your GED, then what you do is you try to get that. You gotta keep yourself busy. The next thing is going to the chapel because it's the only place that um, the inmate feels that they're a human being, that they're not in jail. And so the chaplain can have people, when I was the chaplain at Sing Sing, I was known to have 35 and 40 inmates in the chapel uh, during um, AM, PM, and or evening. And the reason for having them there is because I want to help them to make it through the difficulty of the situation. So therefore, I would design classes, I would uh, design programs, and do everything humanly possible to keep them busy. Do I have any chaplains in here? Okay, fine, am I right? Because it's the only place that they can feel human. Now, if I find a man that can read and write, I'm so glad that you can read and write, Ken, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you and I'm going to keep you with me. I've got you, I've got Damon, what's your name, sir? Tom. Tom, I got Tom. Okay, all three of these can read and write. Guess what they're going to do? They're going to be in the chapel to assist me with those that cannot read and write. Okay? I've got inmates that come in that can't read their mail, so therefore, I've got to help them. It's my job to help. Now, in the old days, in the old days when the prison system started, uh, and we all know that it was started through the Quakers, Yeah, 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 the, the prison system, the Quakers, and that was the idea of giving them, uh, when they came into the prison, the first thing they got was a Bible. You got a Bible, and that was it. You got no books to read, you had the Bible. Okay? And you do know that over in the Muslim countries, uh, uh, what the rule is, you go to prison, you get a Quran, and if you can memorize the Quran, you can be free. Because they said there's no way in the world that you can memorize the whole Quran and not be a changed person. And so basically, the Quakers were saying that what I'll do is I will uh, give you this Bible. You are not to give me any trouble. You are to be quiet. You're not to create any problems at all. And so therefore, the chaplain's duty, before we got sophisticated, was to, uh, to read the inmates' mail and to be careful about what they were doing and sort of monitor them. And so as things changed and you got counselors and everything, because all you had in those days was principal keeper, that was the chief of security, and the warden, which is now the superintendent. And now you have a whole system now where the present consumer of correctional services, they have counselors and they have things that are going on, there's programs, there's education. Uh, the idea was the prison was designed to keep the man, to keep him, and to discipline him or correct him. You got it? Yeah. To correct him. But what happens is, as we saw people come into the confines of the prison, we also saw some mismanagement from a handful of people and, uh, and also men being placed in prison because um, somebody on the outside before they were sentenced had withheld the evidence. Uh, we had situation down in uh, Sing Sing Correctional Facility, he graduated from the MPS program uh, that NYTS has, uh, Dewey Bozella. The reason why I can call his name here is because Dewey made the paper. And why did he make the paper? Dewey was arrested, served 26 years in jail, and Dewey said, every day I saw him, Doc, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. 
And what happened was somebody from New Jersey read Dewey's case and said, I'm going to look at this. And what he did with Dewey was he said, let's pull up the evidence. They pulled up the evidence. The woman was 70 something years old. She had been raped and murdered. And they looked at the evidence and found out it was not his DNA. It was the DNA of a man who had been arrested two years later. Dewey was released immediately. Immediately released. And Dewey comes to church sometimes. Comes to church. The city of Poughkeepsie had to give him eight million dollars. And then you have Lonnie McLeod. I know you've heard the name. Lonnie McLeod, 26 years in prison. Uh, in Sing Sing and his only guilt was he was drunk the night the murder took place. And they found out later that he did not commit the murder. And how did they find it out? The detective was at Mount Sinai Hospital dying of cancer. And he wanted the DA to go to his house. The DA goes to his house and behind his desk they found five cases. They came to Sing Sing and the superintendent told me Lonnie had graduated from the MPS program. The superintendent said to me, bring McLeod up front. And I said, uh-uh, don't bring no inmates up front. No, sir. And so he said, Dr. Hud, bring him up front. I brought him up front and everywhere I went, the officers said, go right through, go right through. Got up to the superintendent's office and there were two lawyers sitting right there. And they said, here's from the judge, you are innocent. And they said to Lonnie, do you want to go back to your cell and get your stuff? <laughs> I can't tell you what it said. <laughs> But it wasn't holy. <laughs> and the superintendent said to me, Dr. Hunt, I need you to do me a favor. And I said, what's that? He says, take McLeod anywhere he wants to go. And so I said, OK. And so I said, now, now you sure this is going to work? He says, I'm going to escort you to the front door. He says he's got his release papers. Take him up to Church Street, get his money out of his account, and take him where he wants to go. I took Lonnie up to Church Street. We got his money. After receiving his money, I said, Lonnie, I have to take you somewhere and get you a shirt. See, we can't be moving around in this shirt. <laughs> So we went down and got him a shirt. And he asked me, could he keep the state shirt? I says, yes. And I got him a shirt. And I said, Lonnie, where do you want to go? He said, Mount Sinai Hospital. I said, Lonnie, I'm not going to take you there to kill that man. He said, Doc, I just want to pray with him. I took Lonnie to the hospital. Lonnie prayed with the man kissed him on his cheek and said, thank you. He said, because of you, I'm a changed man. And so I took Lonnie to his wife, and she couldn't stop crying. Lonnie ended up pastoring a church in Harlem and died of a heart attack. He had a doctorate of ministry and had a very positive change on the community. What happens is this, it was said this morning at chapel service, that when you look at the inmate and read the paper, 
the first thing you say is, that's not the man, but it is the man. It's not the man, but it is the man. And, and is it really the man? It, but, but what happens is, the man that you see is not the same person of the instant offense. If we're arguing and the mom pushes me down, it's a gentle push. He doesn't mean to hurt me, but I hit my head and I die. The mom is arrested for murder. And it was deliberate because he pushed me. And he can't fix it up. It's a violent crime. They're not looking at it as an accident. It can't be argued out. He doesn't have the right attorney. <coughs> he doesn't have the right contacts. And so therefore, he becomes a victim of the system and the systemization of systems. I'm not promoting prison. I don't believe in promoting it, but I do believe in determinate sentencing. Determinate sentencing means that if three people commit a crime, three people will get the same time. And they'll know when they're going to get out rather than to be subject to the personalities that make the decision to release the person. And I also believe that judges, that every judge should be subject to spending a week in a prison every two years. When I did CPE, under Jeff Cuffey, an Episcopal priest. <laughs> I said, to Jeff, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm working with you. He said, yeah. He said, you got jeans? I said, yeah. He said, okay, jeans, work boots, clergy collar, and a denim jacket, dungaree jacket. He said, go to the hardware store and get it. I got it and I showed up at the prison and when I got there, that prison, the tombs in New York City, I said, where do we start? He said, in your prison cell. I said, what? <laughs> he says, I'm putting you in a prison cell and you're going to move with the men for two weeks. So I was put in a prison cell. I had to be there at 7 o'clock in the morning. I moved with the inmates, ate with them, moved with them during the day. And then at 3 o'clock, I was released. Would go back and stay in the cell for the count. And then I was released. After two weeks, I said, OK, now I can begin the chaplain. He said, no. Now you have to be with the social worker. I said, what are we doing? So I spent two weeks with the social workers. And then after that, he said, now you can come to the chaplain's office and begin to work with them. And to understand that you're not working with the scum of the earth, you're working with men that have had a major problem. And your job is to help to get them past the problem. I was saying that uh, when I first got here on Monday, that I was going down to the box, and every day down at the box, solitary confinement, this one inmate would curse me. And I said, OK. <laughs> he said, don't be coming by here, man, and not doing nothing. I said, OK. He said, can you play chess? I said, no. <laughs> so he said, then, you come by here, and I'll teach you. So I said, let me finish what I need to do, and I'll come back. And I did that. I walked 
around the whole box and did everything I needed to do. And then I came back with a chair and through the bars he taught me how to play chess. And I played chess with him for a couple of years. And he said to me, I'd like to get in that program that you have down in the back. He said, if I go to college, will you let me in the program? I said, I'll make a promise to you. If you get out of this, because he had got himself in trouble in, while he was in trouble, I said, I'll do it. Not only did he get his college degree, but he became the valedictorian. Went into the program and aced the program and was the youngest to ever go through the MPS program at Sing Sing. All he needed was a break. What happens is, when I talk about the deconstructionism that exists in our society, as I said to DeMond before, that I had two police officers that I have a great deal of respect for, love them till the day and, 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 and go to visit them. One is uh, Charlie Jackson and Charlie Taylor, and uh, they harassed me. They harassed me. And what they did was, if I were walking with you three gentlemen, what he would do is he would say, Hunt. I said, yes, sir. He says, take everything out of your pockets, put it on the dashboard, on the, uh, on the hood of the car, and lean over. And I would lean over, they'd search me, and then they would search you, you, you. And then he'd say, CYO, PAL. I said, I'm not going to CYO, and I'm not going to the PAL. And he just kept on doing it until I did go. Those programs no longer exist. There's nothing in the confines of our inner city neighborhoods to really give our young people an opportunity to break out of the cycle. And so that if we don't give them a family, then there is a family waiting to adopt them called the gang. And so it's a matter of who is going to do what. We have a program, and, and I'm going to give you this piece of information to put in your theological sack. Uh, I, I don't know whether you know it or not, but we have an educational enrichment program at the Bethel Church. And don't say tutoring. Please, for God's sake, don't say tutoring. Tutoring is eternal. Because if you go to a tutoring program, there's something wrong with me. But if you're going to an educational enrichment program, I'm just trying to get myself better. Okay, and so what we do is we have this educational enrichment program. Do you know that if you go to the colleges and talk to the dean about getting those who are trying to get their teaching certificate, they can do their in-service training with you at your church. And all you have to do is provide a report. Did you know that? Some of you knew it. Uh, 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 the light bulb went on and some people say, I see how this can work now. <laughs> and so what we did is, we did this at the Bethel Church. And, and then what you do after that, go to the insurance companies. Notice I said insurance companies? and tell them you want their old computers. They'll have the IT people to clean them up for you and make sure they're working. And they may ask you if they can come by and check to find out if it's being used to help students. Say yes, because that's what it's being used for. Get the teachers to give you the software that, uh, or tell you about the software. It cost us $500 a year to get updated software and programs for the computers. Now, the Bethel Church is a cosmopolitan church, but what we found out is this, that we have a host of students of color that come to our church for the educational enrichment program because 
92% of the students in Bethel Missionary Baptist Church go to college. Because I lay on it heavy. I lay on it heavy. Every young person, you're not in my program. What's the matter with you? You don't love me? What, 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 you don't love me? You don't love me? And then I'd say, come here, son. Come here, come here. Let me see if you love me. Come on, come on, come on. Yeah, yeah, give the give brother some love. <laughs> program. <laughs> and, and what I do is I get them to come. Now, we were taken to court. Uh, a, a lady, Jewish, took us to court because she said that she didn't want us to pray. We had snacks and we would have prayer. And the snacks are donated by the parishioners. Praise God. Yeah, yeah, Begology 101. Okay. You have not because you ask not. And, 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 um, and I've been spouting that a lot since I've been here. Begology 101. Okay, and so what happens is she took us to court because she didn't want prayer. She didn't want her child exposed to prayer. But she wanted her child exposed to physics. And so the judge said, who's paying for the program? I said, we are. So he told the lady, he said, well, here's how you do it. What time is prayer? He told her. The judge said, then come after. Now the child comes for the prayer. And what we're doing is we're giving an opportunity. We must circumvent the problem before it becomes a problem. You can't start raising a child when they get 15 years old. You know, like people would say, I can't believe how Chad acts in a restaurant. I said, he knows that if he doesn't act right, there's going to be another crucifixion. <laughs> you know? Uh, so he, he was trained at home. He will sit to the table at home. I mean, just like when he's home now, the first thing he does when he comes in, he puts his cell phone away because he, it's not happening. It's not happening, not at the table. And, and, and so what we try to do is we try to change his way. We try to change the way of the people in the church. And we try to change the way of the people in the prison when we meet them. And the reason why we try to change their way, we need them to understand another way of thinking. And you say, well, what do you mean? Do you know that there are some people in Harlem right now today, in Harlem, spending $2,500 to $3,000 a month for an apartment rent? And then I'm telling people that I'm talking to down in the city and everything, I said, do you know that if you move to the suburbs for $1,400, you've got your mortgage? Yeah. And they said, what? I said, yeah, but I got to take a train to get down to the city. Duh. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you need to understand. And so what happens is it becomes our responsibility to look at people in a different way and to help them. I have been very fortunate, um, and even from my beginnings I was very fortunate. I, I was fortunate to learn some things and to experience some things that I never would have experienced. I went to, um, coming from the ghetto, going to Manhattan College because of the two police officers and Mr. Johnson, my history teacher, okay, could have very well got caught up in the rhythm of gangs. But they took me and they saved me. When I got to Manhattan College, I spoke with an accent, a heavy accent. My family is Portuguese, eh? Afro Portuguese. And so what they did was they put me in speech therapy if you didn't notice. <laughs> and then after speech therapy, you know, instead of, you know, uh, intense speech therapy to lose the accent, then all at once 
things began to change for me because I wasn't accepted by the black community, wasn't accepted by the white community because they're Afro and Portuguese. And then people say, I didn't know there were black folk in Portugal. Yeah, they were the first slave traders. Uh, <laughs> so, so therefore, I had people helping me. And as they helped me to escape that environment, then it became my responsibility to help the rest of my family to escape that environment. And, and so therefore, and while I was at Manhattan College, uh, God showered me with a blessing. The ambassador of Liberia's son did not want to be brought to the school every day from New Rochelle from the residency of the ambassador, and he wanted to stay on grounds. And they placed him with Ed Hunt as his roommate. I got to eat good. <laughs> And Charles said to me, Edward, I said, yes. I do not want to drive my car. My car is too ostentatious, too, 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 too elaborate. He had a Jaguar, <laughs> two-seater sports car with diplomatic plates. Oh. You want to drive my Fiat? He says, oh, I must see it. And he says, this would be perfect. I said, the fool doesn't know what diplomatic plates mean. <laughs> I could park anywhere. <laughs> but, uh, and when we graduated, his father put these bracelets on our arms. In Imhota. Imhota. And meaning honored. And uh, Charles wears one, I wear one. And uh, when we meet, we're brothers. But I had breaks where others didn't have them. And do you know that about 85% of the inmates in New York State are of color? 80 to 85%. When you go down the coastline, Philadelphia, uh, into Baltimore, Washington, DC, and, and, you, and you go down, you'll see uh, going into Atlanta, you'll see the prisons at Jersey. The prisons are heavily populated with black inmates. When you get to the Midwest, you see it shallow out, and then you get on the other side. So 35% of all the inmates within the confines of the United States are of color. Now, you also know that Blacks make up 11% of the population, 11.5%. And uh, whites make up 47% and change of the population. But yet and still, there is, there is freedom and justice. And I will tell you, if you can afford it. If you can afford it, it's there. And so when we look at inmates, Sometimes we have to look at the fact that some of them are very guilty and some of them are very innocent. Uh, I was in Comstock Correctional Facility and I met a white inmate and I looked at him and I said, what are you doing here? He said, I committed murder. And so I said, what are you doing here? And he said, I committed murder, and I admitted to it. I went back and I looked at his record, and then I came back and I talked to him. I said, son, tell me what the heck happened. He walked in the house and caught his stepfather raping his sister. And he killed him. It took me eight months, but I got him out of jail. Eight months. The stepfather got up, pulled a butcher knife on him, and he hit him in the head with a cast iron skillet. 
I got him out. There was another young man that I was able to get out who had never been white. He was drunk, sitting in his car in front of a bar in Albany. No keys, and they locked him up for drunk driving. Oh. <laughs> we fought the case. There was a judge in Albany that had said that he was going to give out a thousand years before he left. So we got him out. So there are times when you can help someone, but there's times when you can't help someone. But there's also the situation where we in the community, and especially in our churches, will begin to stigmatize people. And, uh, and, and, and it's, it's a shame of how we look. A pastor in uh, Houston, Texas, new pastor, showed up to the church one Sunday, dressed up like a ball. Oh, you know the story. Yes. And sat on the steps. And everybody stepped around him and everybody talked about him. What are you doing here? One parishioner went back and said, why don't you come into the worship service? And when he stood up and lifted the hat off his head, it was the new pastor. You never know who you're dealing with, but it's a matter of how you treat people. And the thing that we need to understand is that one of the things that we do in the confines, and, and I certainly will be talking about it more, in, in the confines of the program is we tell the inmates when they come into the chapel area, you're a man, and here you are a man. And here you are a child of God. Act like it. Act like it. Don't come in here with your street stuff. This is God's house. Act like it. Understand the norms of the home. And we'll be all right. And I said, now I'm going to trust you. And I'm going to put you on a pedestal. And I'm going to put you on a high one. You knock yourself down. And you know, I've never had a problem. Uh, talking about, everybody heard about the 1985 riot in Sing Sing? The big one, B Block. Okay. I'm in B Block and everything hits the fan. The alarm goes off, the gates are locked. I don't know what's going to happen. Then all at once, I'm grabbed from behind. And I'm picked up and I'm thrown into a cell. And the imam says to two inmates, don't let nobody get near Doc. He's our friend. He takes care of us. And I stayed in there. Eleven and a half hours later, when the riot was over, Dr. Huck, Dr. Huck, where are you? You all right? Yeah, I'm over here, 47. What are you doing? Come on. I, I'm eating. <laughs> I said, you're eating? They had made me tuna fish and rich crackers. I said, I'm eating. <laughs> and these are inmates. I've seen inmates where an officer had been knocked down. Broom, inmate named Broom, he's now a pastor in the Bahamas, stood over the officer and fought for 15 minutes to keep the officer safe. And they said to Broom when he finished, what do you want, what do you want? And he said, I want to work with the chaplain. And he began to work with me, and I told him to put $300 in his account. Amen. Amen. And they put $300 in his account. He worked with me. He went through the program. And Broome's pastoring, and he's a, 
prison chaplain in the Bahamas. He's married and he started his life all over again. Oh, what was he in jail for? A man raped his daughter on the streets of Peekskill and he said, you find him before I do. And he called the police. Two hours later, the police didn't come. And when the man came out and saw Brune, he came up on him and Brune killed him. All he had to do was hit him one time. You should have seen the guy. <laughs> Strong as a government mule. But it was a matter of people go to prison and the first thing we do is we label them. How many people might be in your congregation that have been in prison that you don't even know about? And the reason why you don't know about them is because when they leave the confines of the prison, they can re-blend. Just like I told an inmate, I told an inmate, in here we're all the same. And that's the thing you need to understand. I told them that if there's a riot in here and I take off my clothes and I put on greens, then what happens is they don't know who I am. And so prison is there to help to change people, yes. There are some people that genuinely want to change people and then there are some people there that genuinely want to see them hurt or abused. But the ones that want to help are more than those that want to hurt. And I'm saying to you, as pastors, those of you in the ministry of caring, that I need you to understand that you might not know who you're ministering to, and you might not know who you need to minister to. I know that you might have a jaundice eye, and I know that you might be afraid, but you must remember, the small c, the small c, I want you to start working with the youth. The first thing that will come out of your mouth is, I'll pray about it. I need you to work with the choir, I I'll pray about it. I, I, I need you to work in the nursery. I'll pray about it. But then there's the capital C. The capital C is the one, the divine call, that causes us to have an obsessional obsession to meet the needs of those in need. Caring is everybody's business. David Bonner tells us that. And we need to understand that we should not be in the business of regulating the poor, but liberating the poor. What does Gonzalez says? That sometimes those who have been, those who have been, been oppressed the most can sometimes become the greatest oppressors. I know that when I was going into the prison and the church said, well, you're not going in there anymore, are you? I said, excuse me? I said, now don't get beside yourself. <laughs> And then one day, there was a gentleman in the congregation. I told him, I said, either you'll listen to me here or you'll listen to me in prison. And then he ended up in Sing Sing. And his brother says, could you do me a favor? And I said, what? He says, don't leave Sing Sing until he gets out of jail. He said, I need you to watch out for him. Every person in prison is somebody's child. It doesn't mean that you have to agree with them, but they're somebody's child. And most importantly, they're a child of God. And that's the thing that you need to understand. So I'm grateful that the Stuba family has allowed this gathering to take place. Because see, it became a gotcha moment. When I do funerals, I, I usually call it a gotcha moment. Everybody's too embarrassed to get up and walk out. <laughs> it's a gotcha moment. And I, I thank the Stuber family for creating this gotcha moment. 
because nobody wanted to leave and say, well, you know, it didn't look good me walking out. <laughs> but we, we need to understand that there but by the grace of God go I. And if you have a car accident, if you, anything happens, you, you can end up in prison. And if you don't have enough money to get yourself out, you're going to suffer. So I tell the men all the time that I don't have the courage that you have. And I'll do all I can to help you to get through this. Because caring is everybody's business. And it's our responsibility to help the person. The saddest thing that ever happened to me in a prison was a mother was coming out of the visiting room and she says, oh, Dr. Hunt, you're here still? I said, yes. She said, can you help my other son? She said, you're the only one that I have confidence in. Please help you. And I did. I did, because that's what I do. But I'm getting tired, and I need you to help too. Come out of your ivory tower, and come down and be a wounded healer.